pressing record. I don't even have to introduce such a sparkling personality. Our Esther is beloved by all of us. Uh, she's the kind of person who, I'm going to be honest, she sees the good in you and then she tells you, okay, <laughs> with all her heart. Like it's not, you know, stum that she just tells you something. It's like, I always say to her, I feel like poetry comes out of this person's mouth. Like she's somehow, Esther, you're always able to animate. Like she can make anything come alive. Your food can come alive. Your clothes can come alive. Everything can come alive. My lipstick. So, your lipstick can come alive. So what I'm thinking is, Esther must have been a product of someone very, very special because an apple is <laughs> too far from the tree unless the wind blows. And I really think that I'm, I myself can hardly wait to hear about Esther's father, Zeichel Tzadik Levracha, Rav Mordechai Alon. So Esther, please, if you could tell us all about him. Okay, so first I want to share, share with all of us that uh, the story I will tell you today is belong to all of us. We all care about our parents, our Abba, Ima, I'm sure we all highly there, we think highly of them and we, so I want to light this candle in the memory of all the fathers and all the Imahot, kulanu, of all of us, and Rabbi Meir Balanes, I want to invite him as well to be attending to this uh, Dvar that I'm sharing with you because my mother, Zichrona Livracha, every, every hour, I think she lit a candle to Rabbi Meir Balanes. She didn't leave him alone. <laughs> every minute, something, this one had a fever, wait, she ran, she lit a candle. Somebody giving birth, Rak Rega, running, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir Balanes, Rabbi Meir. It was in her mouth. So this, we have to have him too. Here is the candles. I don't know you see it. And uh, here, yeah, you see the candle. Okay. So we have him and the memory of all our parents that without them, we wouldn't be here. You know, yesterday, Gail talking about Magen Avraham. I don't know why to go so far to Magen Avraham, just Magen Abba, say Magen Abba in the Shmone Esre, because we all cannot be praying doing the Shmone Esre without the Magen of our parents. Because if enough one parent will slay away and go marry a Goya, you will not be here, we're gone. You'll say no Magen and no nothing. You would, wouldn't be here. So we all magenim al each other. So go back to my father. Sorry. Excuse me, Gail. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Esther. Record, please, for okay. Esther. It says it is recording. Oh, it does, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, forgive okay. me. No problem. Sorry, I just didn't see it. Sorry, okay. Esther, I wanted to make okay. sure you were recording. Good to see you, always good to see you. So my father's name was Harav Alon Mordechai. Uh, and he was born in Morocco and uh, he was born in the mountain, you know, in Morocco, I've been to Morocco. So there is the big cities and then there is the, the farm, you know, in Morocco and you say it's a hall without a door. That's where he came from. It's Chla di Blabab. That's how it's a Chla. Chla, it's a, like a deserted place that doesn't have a door. Bab, Bab, you know, it's a door. So no door, without a door, like a place unknown. They really were very, very primitive. The barbarian, you know, the barbarian. So he was born in, I think, in a cave. They live in cave. They live in a very, very bad condition. And yet there was a Melamed there who was teaching the children alphabet. And at age five, the, one second, one second, sorry. I'm so sorry. I left uh, the phone. I, call, I called myself and now it's beeping, beeping, it's bothering me. <laughs> I, that's the only reason I have my phone. I call myself. <laughs> yeah, it's true. 
So I forgot to hang it up. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna mute also my phone. So at age five, my father goes to this Melamed who collect all the children in the village and he teach them the Aleph Bet and basic prayers and tefillot. The Melamed came to my grandmother and he says, I am sorry to tell you, but your son is five years old. He already know more than I know. I have nothing to teach him. He, he can't stay here. So she says, so what do we do? He said, we have to send him to the city. He has to go to the city, to the far city. And she said, but he's only five. He's a little boy. He was her firstborn. He said, well, he's a very smart boy. He knows more than I know. I'm very embarrassed to admit that. But can you imagine that this boy, I, he knows Torah more than me. And he cannot stay here. It will be a waste of a time. And then they made the decision, his parents, and they selling him to yeshiva at age five. He lives his parents, he lives his brother, his sister, and he had another two brothers and two sisters. But he was the only one who was gone to yeshiva at age five because he was very smart. And sure enough that he, he went to yeshiva and high school yeshiva. And from there, he continued to be a rabbi and to be a shochet. And at that time in Morocco, to be at young age, a rabbi and a shochet, it was a very huge thing. Like you can imagine Rabbi Akiva, when he went and he, he was a bur ve'amaret. He didn't know the Aleph Bet, the same my father. He didn't know nothing, then he goes and he come back, when he come back and he's a rabbi and he's a shok, it, it was for them, for the Moroccan, like this Rabbi Akiva coming back. They all waited for him and were so proud of him, but he had nothing to do in that village. He didn't have enough people to teach the Torah and to, to, to practice the Torah for. So he goes to the big city, at that time was meekness in Morocco talking like uh, Yerushalayim. Meknes was a very, very big city and lots of Torah and big Chachamim. And when he arrived to Meknes, he meets the grandmother of my mother. Now my mother, she was the firstborn to her parents and she, her father, that's her father, grandmother, she was M. Habanin. She was like the Bet Yaakov today here. She ran, ran the Bet Yaakov and she was rich, like not very rich, but she was rich enough to take care of all those girls who are going to Bet Yaakov to learn. She will give them clothes, uniform, food, and they will study Hebrew. And she cooked for them and gave them food. So she was M. Habanim. Her name is M. Habanim. And when I was in Morocco, I saw that uh, Talmud Torah, this, the place where she was uh, running, she was like the principal of that. And she was famous for that. Everybody, every problem, everything that has to do came to her. She was the, the big front woman that uh, dealing with the, the community in meekness. So of course, when my father arrived, who received him? He gets received by her. And she looks at my father. My father was tall, very handsome. He always was dressed with a black suit and a tie, very elegant, skinny, very, very black and white movie star. And she, she was so impressed by him from the story that he's from, from Shloch, you know, from the barbarian, that he come from a very very primitive place and he's a rabbi and he's a shochet, you know, like so extreme that uh, she invited him to her house and invited him to the shul and introduced him in front of all the community. And in Shabbat, uh, he was eating by her house and all her children were invited. And of course the grandchildren. And she tells my father, you know, I have lots of grandchildren and granddaughters. So you're gonna see all of them this Shabbat and you just choose whoever you want. 
she's yours. Like for sale, <laughs> the beauty pageant. So my father was like overwhelmed and shy. And he told me I was, I didn't know too much. They gave me so much kavod. So I, I, I didn't handle it. I couldn't handle it. I, I was all alone in like an orphanage and all of a sudden all this attention around me. And then he said, I saw your mom and she came, she just a little blip I saw of her and that's it. I knew that's her, that's the girl I want. And of course, he, I'll make the story short. He, he chose my mother, they don't ask her. My mother always said that she had a sweetheart was waving for her from the window that she would had a heart, her heart to him. Nobody cared. Yeah, I want, I don't want. You like him, you don't like him. Boom. They decide for her and they get married. But I want to tell you, they were the most beautiful couple. She was very gorgeous and so did my father. I told always my mom when she will complain that she never fell in love with him. I said, shut. I would choose him too. If I had to choose, I'm sure I would choose him. You couldn't have a better better looking than Abba. My father was very handsome. So here they are, they get married and they start their life in Morocco. And uh, my, ma my, my mother, they, you know, they live all together. And my father started to make, he was a shochet. He started to slaughter chicken and, and cows and- uh, Esther, the, the, Esther, just yeah. for a minute. Push your screen down because we're only seeing half your face. Uh, okay. Like we're and then he was uh, see your face. Okay, better. Okay. Um, a bit, lots of kvasim, you know, lamb, lamb. They love. They they were having lamb, slaughtering uh, lamb, and uh, he would show it to the to the Moroccan people, the Arabs. He would show it kashel. And all half of it, he would take because they couldn't pay him. They say, take from it. So he will slaughter it, kashel, give them their portion and bring to the malach, the mlach, that's the name of the city where the Jewish, the ghetto, the Jewish ghetto called mlach. And the king of Morocco was very good to the Jew. He loved the Jewish people. And the king of Morocco knew that the Morocco succeeding because of the, Mor the Moroccan people in his country. So he was watching them and he was protecting them. They never were afraid. So they had a very good life and they were getting wealthy. They could carry any jobs they want and buy houses and they had really free life in Morocco. So my father started to become very rich just from being shochet like so much meat and give meat to everybody. And, uh, and they were selling it and living very beautiful life and bought a beautiful house. And then 1948 comes. So what happened in 1948? Somebody can tell me something important that happened in 1948. Eretz Israel born. Eretz Israel, Kama, and it was a big excitement in Morocco and the Jews. And my father, the first day Israel became independent, says, we are moving to Eretz Israel. I don't care. Everybody said, why? We have such a good life here. They didn't want the Moroccan were very spoiled. They had beautiful life. They didn't want to go to Morocco. The first boat, boat that leaves in Morocco to Israel, my father on that boat with my mother, he doesn't ask nobody, not even his mother-in-law and her grandmother, the, the big mache, they're going. So as they about to leave, the sister of my mother, Dodaruti, who is a very important person in my life, she was 14 years old. She says to my parents, I want to come with you too to Israel. I want to come too. So last minute they take her, they leave me with two kids. They have two kids. They have Rina and Chaim and uh, living to Eretz Israel. Now, when they left Eretz Israel, where are you, girl? I don't see you. I, do you hear me? 
Hello? Yeah, we hear you. You hear me? Good. Yes, okay. Very Good. well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I, I thought I lost you because it was black. The screen all of a sudden turned black. And uh, they live to Israel and uh, they stop in uh, Algier on the way to Israel. The, on the, yeah, you cannot go direct. It was very hidden, very quietly. Morocco didn't let the Jew leave. They wanted them to stay. So they left like Ganavim in the middle of the night, very quietly, in very harsh way. In Algeria, they stayed for a while. It took a while to get the visa. It was, even though Israel was independent, it was still war in Israel, independent war, and was not easy to enter Israel. So they stayed in that camp for a while. And then my mother became pregnant again. And when they arrived to Israel, they are, she's already seven months pregnant, like took them seven months the way to come from Morocco to Israel, seven months. And when they get off the boat, you know, they, there was a, a time in Israel, the kibbutzim were controlling Eretz Israel. Unfortunately, like, you know, they, they felt they owned the country and they, because they were before, they were halutzim, they were there from 1990 and some of them even from 1880, they were from Russia, all the pioneers. So they owned Eretz Israel. And when they, they would decide the life of people, when they come on the boat, they decide you gonna go to X city and you gonna be religious and you're gonna be not religious. You're gonna be in a kibbutz and you're gonna be in a moshab and you're gonna be there. And the people, you have to understand, they were like sheep coming, some of them from the Holy Coast. They don't know a word in Hebrew. They don't know where they are. They, it, all the dream of Eretz Israel was Eretz Chalav, the milk and honey. They thought that they would come to this uh, oasis, like country with oranges, with tapuzim, with green and beautiful smell. And they arrive into a country that hot like crazy, that the sun, the Shemesh was so nervous that burns your brain, you sweat, people impatient, people hungry, people tired, people depressed. Half of the people were destroyed completely. The Ashkenazim, all the Ashkenaz, broken heart, like arrived to Israel. It was a very difficult time in Eretz Israel, even though it's independent and we have a new country, but that was only three, four days, this Simcha, dancing in the street, Eretz Israel, Eretz Israel. But the real day and the real life in Israel, every day was a struggle. Every day was a battle. Every day hunger, every day miscommunicated. They don't know the language. They could not talk to each other, could know what they want, where they want. Very, very difficult time. They take my mother and my father, put them in near Chadera, in, in, uh, in the mud place, you know, it's not even a village, nothing. They built tent, they put tent and put them to live in a tent. Now at night, the rain start to rain and it's muddy and they sinking and cold. My mother with two kids, little children, and she's pregnant and she's a princess from meekness, you know, she, she was uh, married the rich guy who give her, she had the lamb for breakfast and, uh, all the best food for this, all of a sudden, nothing. Like uh, whatever they give you, you say thank you. And then they put them in a place that uh, in Chadera, Kfar Chana, Kfar Chana, that's what it's called. My father says to the guy from the Sochnut, the agency that uh, of uh, the UJA, he said, what do you mean Kfar Chana? My father tells him, I want Yerushalayim. You know Yerushalayim? He says, no. And Yerushalayim, Adoni. No, and Yerushalayim. He says, you know, for me, not Yerushalayim. I go back to Morocco. Nothing in Eretz Israel for me is, is uh, Eretz Israel. Only Yerushalayim. Just Jerusalem is Eretz Israel. And I must tell you, my father always said that. Even me, later on, years later, would tell me, Shum davar en, rak Yerushalayim. Just Yerushalayim. Eretz Israel is Yerushalayim. And later on, when I learned that what he meant, because I, I, I was a child, I didn't understand what he said, but in time of Mashiach, you know, 
כל ארץ ישראל will be ירושלים. And I'm talking the borders of till Lebanon and till uh, Iraq, to the rivers of Babylon, that will be considered Yerushalayim. Call the Yerushalayim. And my father, he would believe, he will swear in the Bible, Yerushalayim, that's Yerushalayim. The, he, the, he, that is Yerushalayim. Eretz Israel is Kula Yerushalayim. So in the morning, after two days living in the rain, he get up by himself. He leaves my mother. He says, I'm going... Don't worry about me. You hang on here. I'll be back. Don't be afraid. It will take me a long time. I don't know how long I'm going, but I'll be back and I'm going to take you to Yerushalayim. We're going to go to Yerushalayim. He leaves that place and he goes. Now, luckily, my father knew Hebrew because he was a rabbi. He knew to read and write in Hebrew, but like Rabbi Mahalovich, Hebrew, you know, oh, Gail. The pasuk, she wants to tell me a sentence. She said, the pasuk, it's a pasuk. It's a, <laughs> it's a, a biblical Hebrew, but you get it, you manage with that biblical. It was, it helped him. He gets, he goes to Yerushalayim. He gets into Yerushalayim, into the main city and all Yerushalayim is black, destroyed from the war in the Arab everything broken, everything black, everything empty and bombs and danger. And he goes, he just goes, he goes and he, he see, walks into a house and he see empty because there were, before 1948, Jerusalem was lived by Arabs. They lived in those homes. And in the war, when we won and Israel became independent, they were afraid and they deserted the sea, the houses and left. So all Yerushalayim empty like I Chavavot. I don't know how you say it in a, a city that after a war, you know, that it's empty. That's how it is. Like in the movie, The Pianist, if you saw Europe, that's how was Yerushalayim. All, all the home, building, building, empty, empty, empty. And all you see like half of it crashed down, balconies, everything destroyed. And he see a house, beautiful house, and he goes in and he says, this is my house. He, he walks into that house and he designated to be his house. Ze Abai Chedi. And as he says, Ze Abai Chedi, and he puffing in his body into that body, the Sukhnut coming, you know, those girls with the paper and pencil. Adoni, Adoni, Ma'atosepo, what do you do here? He told her, shh, don't tell me what I do here. This is my home. Ze abai cheli. I go to bring now my nimevi isha cheli. I bring my wife with three kids in the moshav, in the mud, in the mud, in the rain. They're coming here. Oh, who are you? She's shocked. He speak Hebrew. Now she changed her way to talk to him. Ani harav alon mordechai mimikness that I lived in a hall without a door in that uh, club in meekness and I taught myself to be a rabbi. I'm a shochet and I'm a, a rabbi and I live in this house and this is my house. She looks at him like that shocked. She said, yeah, it is your house. And you know what? Since you're married and you have two children, I'm going to give you a grocery store too. Do you want a grocery store? He said, of course I want the grocery and giving it to you free, free, yes. Next to that house, there was a main street and there was a grocery store. She says, that will be yours. She was so impressed to see a Moroccan Jew who speak Hebrew, the confidence and left the, his wife over there in that. She said, you deserve it. You can have a store. You can run a store because you know to read, you know to write, you know cheshbon, you know to add and subtract. Do you understand what you're dealing with the, with the for that, at that time, my father was uh, almost Einstein in Israel. So she told him, and how are you going to go back? He said, I don't know how. The same way Hashem brought me here, he will take me back to where She said, no, no, no. I'm going to give you a truck. You go bring your wife and your children. She gets somehow managed to him get a truck open, you know, nothing like, uh, don't imagine, like out 
in the rain, in the cold, you sit on a bench, on a, if you sit, sit, if you fall, you fall. She sent with him and told him, come back immediately. Don't hesitate because you'll lose this house. Bless you. Bless you. So they leave and they, he goes and bring my, my, my mother and they go into back to Yerushalayim and my mother don't believe. He says, don't, Zohar, Zohar, I tell her, I have found a house, we're gonna live, we were living. And he came with the truck. She says, I, I thought you would come with the sheep, with the chicken, but to come with, with the truck, that's huge. So yeah, that truck taking us back home. So immediately they left and they get, so soon that he finished and they settled, my parents, he, he opened that makolet and start doing many immigrants, immigrants coming, coming immigrants to Israel. It's a very difficult time and people fight and people upset and people cry and people wants to go back to their home, wherever they came. And my father became, you know, last week parasha was this parasha actually, not last week. Last week was Kriyat Yamsuf, but this week dealing with Yitro, you know, introducing Yitro. And Yitro, he was the father-in-law of Moshe. And he entered to the Torah that he received his own parasha to be on his name. Why? Why would you say he was a Kohen of Midian? He was not even a Jew. He received to get a parasha to be his name. So last yesterday, last night in the parasha, the rabbi said, Rashi says, because he heard about Kriyat Yamsuf, he heard what Hashem did to Am Israel, and he came. He knew that Hashem is the one. But I want to tell you why I think Yito came. That's Rashi, I agree with Rashi. I never argue with Rashi. I love Rashi myself. But I, my personally think why Yito received a Torah in, a, in the Torah to have his own parasha on his name, because he helped us, he helped the Jew. He was the light to us in the desert. He showed us where are the enemy, where is the snake, where is he? He, he knew the desert, we didn't know desert, we don't know what desert. And why I bring Yito to the story of my father because my father became like he told after the experience he had with his, uh, with Yerushalayim and he, he found a house for himself. He went back to that camp. He, he settled my mother, he settled uh, them in the home and went back and started taking all the Moroccan guys who didn't have the language, who didn't know a word in Hebrew. And they were sending them to places, to kibbutzim, taking their children and making them non-religious, making them away from the Torah. And my father, you know, just by himself, alone as a person, fighting for each boy and each family, putting them in Yerushalayim, putting them in places and telling them their rights. They didn't know what their rights, the Moroccan people, they come as Olim Chadashim, Ole Chadash is a new immigrant, and they had some rights. So he tells them, ask Yerushalayim and ask Baka. He was telling them the neighborhoods, which are a good neighborhood, which is a good place to be, which place is not. And taking the children to school, to religious school, sending them to yeshivot. And I want to tell you, as a child, me growing in my house, I only remember people coming, falling on the floor in front of my father, like kissing him going on their knees. And my father didn't like that. He was not at all like this, but they were like, he was like, like shaliach of Hashem to them. He was saving them because they would get house. They would get places, they would get food. They would get money. The children went to school. So he was the eyes of the Moroccan people. So this is the beginning. Later, like after they, uh, he, he has the Macaulay, right? The convenience store. And it takes too much toil work to do it. And he didn't, he couldn't. He said to my mother, I'm a rabbi. I'm not to sit in a Macaulay and, uh, and sell uh, cheese and bread and Coca-Cola and drinks. This is not for me. I have to be 
I have to be with the people. I have to do things outside, not to, to sit in the store. So they were starting to argue about that because my mother was the woman. A woman, you know, she looks for her food, for her children, what were the money to keep my, my children alive. So, and my father could not be there. He, his head was not at all in money. He was the opposite of money, didn't interest him. My father only cared about how he be a good Jew and how to promote Hashem and to do dvarim chashuvim, like study Torah, uh, go to yeshiva, get people to be close to Hashem, to keep mitzvot, to keep the chagim. That's where his mind. So it was a point where he didn't come to the Makolet and my mother with her being pregnant every, every second year, she's pregnant with another child with the babies in the Makolet. It was very hard, but that's the way it was. And thank God my brothers grew up and they were helping her and her sister that came with her, Dodawuti, and they ran the Makolet. My father refused to go to the Makolet. He would not be there. He kept doing what he needed to do. Now, because my father was in Jerusalem and graduated in Morocco, there were the religious office said to my father, you know, we cannot accept your title, the rabbi and the shofet. You have to pass the exam. We have to, to do it here. My father said, what? I already a leader. He has his own leader in the neighborhood that he brought all those Moroccan straight from the boat into the neighborhood where he lived. It's like a Westmount shul. Can you imagine now Robert Mahalovic they come telling Oh, you have to do this uh, exam again, and you have to, to do a test again to prove us that you're a shochet. So they said, what do you mean? I'm, I'm shochet every, every, every hug, every holiday. I'm shochet him, and, and I'm, I'm leading them. I'm their rabbi. So they said, no, this is the law. This is how it is, and you got to redo the exam. I remember this time was very, very difficult time at my house where my father started to study like a little boy. And I think in two, three months, he passed the exam and shochet, he, he doesn't just get the shochet, he was the highest shochet. Like they, they knew what he was doing and they, they said, we apologize to you, Rabbi Mordechai Alon. We're so sorry, but that's the Kachaze Be'eretz Israel. This is a very common sentence. Kachaze Be'eretz Israel. Again, I don't know if I if you hear me. Sorry that I'm uh, I see the dark. Gail, where are you? Hello? Gail? Yeah, hi, we see you so clearly. Yeah, and you have to, because perfect. I see a dark, I see a dark, it's very hard to, to talk to. Do you see dark. any other faces? Now I see you. No, okay. I don't and see Amita, you. And Amita, do you see Amita? We're all here. Okay, so from time to time, I will call you. Just you okay, know. Okay, perfect. So I think you lit, you lit back, you know? Okay. Like the story with the candles that I told you, <laughs> <laughs> right? So now I'll share with you this story. So sure enough, like the, we are already in the year uh, 1950, like 10 years in Israel. My father, they came in 1949. In 1956, I was born and I was the number eight. I was number eight, but my mother had other eight miscarriages, which really should have been 16 children. But uh, she, she lost few pregnancy. So I'm number eight that's alive, but uh, we, we, there were more pregnancy that she was like, almost like Gail, Baruch Hashem. So when I was born, things start to change. All of a sudden, Israel turning, it's already settling, more confidence, better country. Uh, starting to build the, the country and the army is very secure and we win the war, we win in, uh, 
56, 1950, there is a war of Sinai, Milchemet Sinai, it's with Egypt, there is a war. And I was just born. And they came from the Sochnut, the UJA to my mother and said, so, you know, you have a baby and uh, we have to feed her and there was no milk and no food. It's all on coupons. So give us the baby and uh, we will take care of her. And after the war, we'll give it to you back. So my mother said to, to them, I'm not giving you any of my babies and any of my children. You're not taking any of us. Whatever we have, they will eat. And if we starve and die, they will starve and die with us. That's what it is. None of the kids living. And you have to know at that time, they were stealing children in Israel. It was unfortunate. It was the story where they taking the children, especially from the Sfaradim and the Yamanite, because they had lots of children and they were thinking, oh, they have so many kids. So what's, what's the big deal? They're one less and would give it to the Holocaust survivor that couldn't have children, or they were giving them to America. Some of the kids are found in America. So it was a very, very, it was already, they were talking about it all. They knew about this problem. So every Sfaradi, my father warned them, don't ever let go of your children. And if they need to be in a hospital, stay, the mother stay with the baby, at the, with the hospital, with the baby 24 seven, don't leave till you bring him back. Don't leave him alone. He knew my father because he was reading the newspaper and he was educated where the others in other places, they didn't have this. And believe me, they lost their children. So then 1956, um, I'm, I'm born. And when I was born, my mother told my father, I don't want to live in this neighborhood because there was still immigrants from Morocco, even though there was a big house and nice, but it was not, it turned to be not a good neighborhood. There were poverty and there were mixed of uh, some kids that were not good, not good for my mother, for, for our education. She said, I do not want to continue to live here. We have to move. We're moving to a better neighborhood. She wanted to put us in a good school. It was very important, the school. So I, I learned about school from my mother at a young age, how important where you live, not where you live and what house, how big and beautiful, it's where the neighborhood where you live. Are you close to a shul? Are you close to a good school where your kids will go? So we are moving from a big, beautiful house to a smaller house where eight children, two bedroom, much smaller, but in a location that she wanted the school. This is the school that she wanted us to go. I thank her till today that I was really in a very good school. I was very lucky and fortunate because the school really would make a child. And the school I went, I study, it was Ma'ale, that's the name of the school. Ma'ale from the word Me'ule, Me'ule, which means Metsuyanin, you know, when you are excellent, it's excellent. That was the name of the school. And she was so, it was so important to her that to see us going to, just to say the word, we're going to Ma'ale. People asked her, how are you, Giveret Alon? She said, my kids go to Betzefer Ma'ale. That's how she would answer. She, the most important thing is where the kids go. She didn't even hear what they're, they're talking. My kids go to that school. So we go to that school and it's really very, very good. And things look very promising. And my, my mother, they run the Macaulay. And my father doing his businesses, now he's growing in the religious office and he get to have his own secretary and he is uh, promoting him and he become a bigger rabbi and they give him to handle all the south of uh, Jerusalem. They, he started to, to establish his uh, place in the religious office. That's where he was uh, working. Now, at the same time, my... Uh, my grandparents coming from Morocco, the grandparents that I already told you, I think some of you I see smiling. So you remember the story with my big fat Greek uh, wedding, the grandmother with the black dress, 
And my grandmother, she had a very bad osteoporosis. So she was all hunched down. You could never really see her. She was always going down. It was very sad. But me as a child, I didn't have the rachmonis on that. Like for me, it was a, uh, uh, and I was uh, the real Sabra, you know, Sabra, it's Sabarit. Like they, they would call me Sabarit. They, sometimes they wouldn't call me Esther, my name. They call me Saba, the Saba, which mean in a bad way. It was not a compliment to call me a Sabra. It was not a compliment to be Sabra because the Sabra is like the Sabras, you know, the prickly from outside, the chutzpadik, and they talk a lot and they, they demand and everything they're entitled, but inside they are sweet and yummy. So I was the Sabra. So my grandparents arrive and of course my father, they don't go to no farm and no tent right away to a house. He find them a house, he fix them a place and they, he saved them all the struggling that other immigrants were getting and many, many other people, so many. And some people, even my father promoted them to be in a very, very higher, in a yeshiva, to be the Rosh Yeshiva. And I have one of them that he made into the city, the main, uh, the, he became the Rosh uh, of the Iria, the head of the city, city, and they were in uh, <clears throat> Bechean, and he had already a chauffeur and a driver, that man, his name Yoshua. And every time we would go in the summer for vacation to him, and the driver would come pick us up and take us. And he will, every time he comes with the driver and he says, this driver and this car belong to your father. You understand? It's all what I have is from your father because your father put me and pushed me into where I am and who I am today. You will not be your father. I probably will be in a Macaulay in the store selling uh, fruit and vegetable. But he pushed me and he pushed me and he showed me that it's possible. So my father was saying everything is possible. In energy Israel, everything is possible. So from here, uh, we go into the story of the Chagim. So I want to start, first of all, about Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim, the city that I grew as a child. Sandy, I see you now. So Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim is the most beautiful city. And Shabbat in Yerushalayim, every Shabbat, like we were eight children, and my mother loved to cook and bake. So when I cook and bake and I have all this passion, it's from home, it's come from her. And the food, all the food we had in baskets of laundry, you know, when you, we were eight and with my parents, 10, plus Dodaruti, her sister, and then Dodaruti got married and then uh, more guests that every time my father will bring, every Shabbat, minimum 20, not less than 20. Lunch, Shabbat lunch, my father goes to shul. And when he come back from the shul, I was the spy. My mother will send me like this. She called me from my ears, go, go count how many people your father coming with. So she, she would know how to prepare. She never knew how many people coming back with my father that he invite for lunch. So I tell her, I could, I could count, I think, to 20. At 20, I, I couldn't. So I told her, more than 20. I think 100, mommy. 100? I think 100. Yeah, I think 100. Oh, yo, yo. Oh, my voice. So she, she knew, that's it. Whatever will be. And I want to tell you, nobody, nobody was hungry. The food grew in my house. I would see how halot, like five halot turned to be 10 in front of my eyes. How the chamin, the chulent, grows to be for a hundred people. There, there was only 20 potatoes there, but when she served, they, they grew in the pot and everybody received a potato. And I would tell her, Ima, cut to half, cut to half. She said, don't tell me what to do. You just serve the dishes. Go take the dishes and serve. And the potatoes kept coming out and out and out and everybody got their own now, what I have from my childhood, 
I told Gail about it. This, you see, Coca-Cola, the drink. I have um, one of my, uh, the, how Gail said, the bruises that we have is soft drink. When we only had a soft drink on Shabbat, all week, mayim, water, nothing. There's, and, and I wanted drink, it was a soda or ginger ale or orangeada, or those are the popular drink. It started to be popular. The whole world became into Coca-Cola and Sprite and ginger ale. So I would tell my father, you have to buy ginger ale. You have to buy it now. There is new. It's orangeada and there is limonada and there is all the names that I hear in the commercial, in the radio, whatever I hear, I wanted to have at home. So my father says, okay, so you will buy one, a bottle of this. But in my house, the minute, the minute in the air, you know, in the air, the bottle will evaporate. I never could have reached to have a drink. Never, never, because I was the smallest. I didn't know to fight and would disappear. With this, there was no miracle. It was miracle with the potatoes, but not with the drinks. So I have like today, till today, the minute I enter any store of supermarket, the first thing that I put in my cart is Coca-Cola, ginger ale, this from my childhood, because I would never, could never had my own drink. So I have a complex, that's the word. I was looking for a complex with soft drink, to have soft drink. So, okay, Shabbatot was the most beautiful Shabbatot. Every Shabbat, every Shabbat, honestly, is like the Shabbat, you could eat Shabbat. The Shabbat was not just Shabbat, it's you eat Shabbat. Achanu et Shabbat, the Shabbat, itself from the, the Friday night till Motze Shabbat, including Seudah Revit Le David Amelech, where my parents kept all the tradition. At Seudah Revit, they would play music and had all their young friends, couple that are the same age like them, coming to the house. And then my mother will make a barbecue, supposedly barbecue, but he always had meat. They had like a grill on the electric that you put one on top of the other and you make barbecue. Most of the time it was burnt barbecue and they would listen to the Morocco radio. There was a shidur, a direct line on Motzei Shabbat where you can send regards to your family in Morocco, Kol Israel, the radio channel connected you like Zoom, the first Zoom between Morocco to Israel on Motzei Shabbat. And this is the most beautiful tochnit program that I remember as a child, how my mother sitting and crying, waiting, maybe she will hear her parents sending her a regards or maybe her sister or her brother. And once they did talk, they did talk and, and she fainted. My mother fainted on the floor because she heard her brother sending her Lezohra, the Mordechai, Neshikot, and regards and love because we miss you so much. So <laughs> we end up in the hospital. But because she heard her, her brother on the radio, she was so overwhelmed with excitement. So this was a Shabbat. Then the Chagim. The Chagim in Eretz Israel, like Rosh Hashanah is a uh, is, uh, Rosh Hashanah, you know it's Rosh Hashanah. Like you cannot think for a second that it's a Purim or it's just Chag, another holiday. You know, this is Rosh Hashanah. The whole city, the whole people start from Chodesh Elul, knocking on the door every morning at four o'clock. Harav Alon Mordechai, Selichot, Selichot. Selichot, waking up, walking in the street, waking the whole people, never mind the people. What about us? We wake up too. They, everybody wake up early, a month before from Rosh Chodesh Elul to do Selichot before Rosh Hashanah. Now in Yerushalayim, every corner, every place, like any hand that you reach, right, left, you touch a shoe. You touch a Bet Midrash, you touch a Yeshiva. I lived in the street, Rehov Harav Kuk. 
And why do you think it's called Rehov Rav Kook? Sandy, why do you think they would call it Rehov Rav Kook? Guess. What? Unmute yourself. Rav Kook used to live there. The yeshiva of Rav Kook. That's ah. right. Kolakovod. Sandy, yes, you're right. He lived in the yeshiva. So I grew with the Rav Kook himself. Now we live at the beginning of the street and on top of the street. That's where the yeshiva and Harav Kook live there. Now, Harav Kook, it's a, it's a bank. Do you understand when a bank, like you have Royal Bank? That's who is Harav Kook. He is the first banker of the Torah who made, waved the Datim and the Chilonim together, who before Chabad, because then came Chabad, then Chabad were accept the Chilonim and accepted whoever you are, you are loved. And this, there was not, there was not like that. So they were so black and white, Ashkenazim, Sfaradim, Datim, Chilonim. If you Chiloni, the Chiloni hate the Dati, the Dati hate the Chiloni. The Sfaradim hate the Ashkenazim, Ashkenazim hate the Sfaradim. So to, to see the first person that realized and made shalom and say, we're all the same. Hey guys, Dati, Lodati, Ashkenazi, Sfaradi, you are, we are the same. We are one, was Araf Kuk. And he paid for it with his life. Don't think that it was easy. The Ashkenazim were criticizing him, were, giving him the hardest time, but he was not fighting them because he did it in a way that I don't know even how to tell you, but he did it. He finally found the, the road and the paved road to go between all the Sfaradim, Ashkenazim, Datim, Chilonim, and to love everyone. He would look at the Chavre Kibbutz, the Kibbutzim who, who were, killing chickens by doors, you know, taking a chicken, slamming the doors, tuck, chicken, another one, another attack, another, like they didn't slaughter kashut, they just, and then sending the Moroccan children that are in the kibbutzim for Yom Kippur home, pitying them because they're hungry and they have no chicken, no food. They're sending a boy with a chicken back home, but there is no head on the chicken. So the mother look at the father and said, and what's this? He said, go bury that chicken. Don't even leave it outside that not even the birds to eat it. Bury it very deep, deep in the ground. It's not kasher. This is the life. This is Israel at that time. And now Haraf Kook making, making some, something there that he started and he succeeded to make it the beginning of the redemption of the Datiim and the Chilonim. So I lived in that street and he obviously, because my father is a rabbi and he started to be famous with him, they became friends. And Simcha Torah in my house, the first stop of the yeshiva when they go, because they would, all the Talmidim would get out from the yeshiva and do tour all over Jerusalem in Simcha Torah. So the first stop was at my house and my mother will make a buffet out in the street. We'll make them all Moroccan food and harif, you know, the Ashkenazim, they know gefilte fish, they know lekach, the, the kugel, nothing. She would make them the most Moroccan hottest food and they're <laughs> dancing and they're drinking lechaim and they're eating it. I don't know if they like it or they didn't like it, but I remember looking at them and they're all, they're all burning in their mouth <laughs> when they eat. But it's Simcha Torah, so I didn't know if they dance, they're jumping from the Torah or jumping from the food in their mouth, but they were jumping. So this is for me Simcha Torah. Then come Sukkot, Chag Sukkot. In Yerushalayim, there was a competition. Who has the most beautiful Sukkah? So we all were in entering to the competition, writing to the city to come to check the sukkah and we would put all our neshama to make, to build the most beautiful sukkah. But next to us was the landlord who was, we were living on his house. He owned 
third of the house. In Israel, it's called mafteach. Like there is a landlord that he owns only a third of your house and you own two thirds. So he was the third, but he was a landlord and he was very rich. And they were Bukharim, the Bukharim Jews. The Bukharim are the most proud people from the Sfaradim. They don't consider themselves Sfaradim. Like they're not Sfaradim, but they're not Ashkenazim too. So what they are, I don't know, Bukhari. but they're not. They will tell you, we are not Marokaim. We're not Sfaradim. We are Bukharim. Okay, but are you Ashkenazim? No, we're not Ashkenazim. <laughs> but they are proud and the, most of them are very wealthy and very proud people. So they owned the synagogue right in the house where I lived, the corner of the house. Like my house was a big house that very rich family, Arab's family owned. It's like the Casa Loma, you know, you take the Casa Loma and they divided it to eight families, eight families and four uh, business. One business was a printer that printed the newspaper. There was the synagogue and there was a uh, Nagar who made glasses, like a guy who made glasses. So four small businesses, big shul, and eight families divided, and we lived in that house, center, center in Yerushalayim, like Yafo and the Midrachov. You know the Midrachov? It's very famous. Like uh, if you see Rav Kook, it's right in the Midrachov Yerushalayim. We are the center of the center. So every bomb and every pigua, all the glasses were shattering in our house. So in uh, 67 war, we're going into a 67 war. There was a very big tension. Just another uh, insight that a year before the 67 war, my mother passed away. My mother passed away, she was very young. She was 42. And I don't want you to be sad when I tell you about my mother, because the story of my mother, even though she died young, is not sad. Because my mother, what she did at 42, and I love when Gail says, when you go, when you come to this world, everyone has the bus, you get on the bus, and in other words, your bus stop that you have to get off, that's your bus stop, that's where you need to go. So I know that that was the stop that my mother had to get off at 42, and that's where she got off. But what she left after her is not the 42 years, it's a 420 years. So much thing that she do, she did. And that's why it was sad. Yes, it was sad. And her, in her funeral, there was a whole river, you know, they showed this week, uh, this rabbi uh, in Israel. Yeah, did you see in Yerushalayim? Salavechik, yeah. And they, and, the, and I don't know who, like Shtitzel said the Rishayim Arurim, the Rishayim Arurim in the media, they took a cake of uh, poppy seed. They took a poppy seed cake and they put the trail of all the datiim that are black, 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 black heads and they compare them, they look the same. And like they make, they, they, they're making like sarcastic. I find it very offending. But as I looked at it, I said, I looked at the Hasidim that they look like the poppy seed cake. And I said, this is the most delicious poppy seed cake. This one, this one with all the datim there that are the trail, they going, they were going to that funeral. So that's how it was in my mother's funeral. That poppy seed cake, that beautiful cake, all the, the all the yeshiva boys came, all the one that were eating her food in in uh, in uh, uh, Simchat Torah, they were there. And I'm sure that with all this poppy seed going to in front of Hashem, she had a beautiful welcome there. So from there, from right away, a year, the following year is the 67 war where uh, uh, Jerusalem become one. We win the war. And just to tell you, so you'll know how close we were into that war, al of Kelim. So I, um, that's Shmuel, <laughs> sorry. So I, uh, we were, we were, 
Where was I? In, it was uh, the year before, the year yes. uh, of the 67 war. 67 war. So to tell you how close we were, that in the war, in the war, when the war, there was a bomb fell, a bomb fell in my house, in my house, like next to the window. And if it would have exploded, we would not be alive. We would not, all of us there, the whole big uh, families. There were, that, that bomb didn't blow. It just got stuck on the ground and it, it, and it, didn't, it did not blow. So it's the miracle. Like there were so many miracle in, in, in Yerushalayim, in my, in my childhood, in my life that you don't, I don't need to study Parashot Shavua. I don't need to study Torah to see miracles. I can tell you that one second. No matter what, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, it was miracle that I seen in front of my eyes. The same like when I when I study and they say in Egypt that every um, shifcha, every uh, maid and maids, you know, that used to help the families, would see miracle more than uh, the miracle, the 10 miracles that happened, like the pledges that Hashem gave. I've seen miracle in Eretz Israel, 67 war, the biggest miracle, it's like Kriyat Yamsuf, like people that saw the sea split. I saw how Hashem killed seven countries where every day before the war, before the war, we were putting bags of, salt, of uh, sand on the windows and on the doors and, and tapes, putting tapes on the windows and we knew the Arabs saying in the radio, I would hear, we're going to push all the Jews to the water. And I used to say, well, I know to swim. I know to swim. They're going to take us, push us to the sea. So I used to tell my father, well, I know to swim. You don't know, but I know how to swim. So he said, don't worry. I know to swim better than you. I have Hashem. He will, we will never be in that deep. And, and that exactly what happened. The war started. My father, I told you, he never was in the Makolet to help my mother. He was only dealing with things that are spiritual. He cannot deal with Makolet, with bills of electricity, water that was not in his head. So he never knew the school that my mother was talking, the school that she wanted to send us. He really didn't know if it's cool. He trusted her that she knows what she's doing. He never saw my school, never saw my teacher, never saw my report card, nothing. My father was in a different world, yet he was very much in the house, but he was not. So comes the war, the war, and uh, my mother passed away. We don't have a mother now. And who, my father never was in my school, never knew who was my teacher. And the first person who come to school to pick us, his children from home, from the war, because the war started, the war started nine o'clock. By 11 o'clock, they started already saying in the radio to pick up kids from school, there is a war. My father was the first one who came to pick me and my sister. We were two of us in the school. And I look, Abba, how did you know where is the school? How do you know where is my school? And he looks at me like this, embarrassed. He was embarrassed that he didn't know how he knew. He said, don't worry how I know. I know everything. I know everything. He took, grabbed both of us, put it under his jacket, his coat, and cover us. And we have to go under bomb. The first day was the worst day when the war started. All Jerusalem was bomb, bomb, and tanks, and, and airplane above from everywhere. And he told us, just walk, don't look, not right, no side, don't let go of my hand. He held strong on our, on to me and my sister. And it was like a seven minute walk from the school to my house. We didn't live far, but I remember the bomb falling and I hear a woman screaming, like she, I knew she was, she wounded, but we couldn't see. I did not see, I did not see, but I heard it. I heard that somebody got the, uh, wounded i'm just telling you how close we were into the war and we go home 
We get into the house, all the children in the house, all the neighbors, the eight families that were above in that house, there was two floor in our house because my house was designated as a shelter. We had very thick wall. So the army said, this is a shelter. You don't need to go to the shelter, stay at home and you're fine. But the second floor, the second floor has to come down. So half we took and then other people that were living also on the main floor, they stay there. So I was excited, it was fun, you know, all the children that I play with them all day long, now living with me, we're gonna be together. My father went into the second room, we had only two bedrooms. He put the tefillin on and his talit, and that's it. I did not see my father for three days. He did not get out from the room. He did not take off the tefillin from his head, not the talit, nothing, we didn't hear. On the third day, we didn't hear anymore the bombs, we didn't hear the tanks, we didn't hear cars driving, it was quiet, very quiet. Just like in a movie, you know, when you wake up and nothing there, you don't know, but you don't know what, what, what really happened. But quiet, very quiet. And then my father says, this quiet is quiet of Mashiach. He took off his tefillin, he took off his talit, he put it down, he lifted me on a table and said to me, listen, this is a year when my mother passed away. He said, my daughter, I want to tell you, Mashiach is here. We are living to see Mashiach. Yerushalayim is one, we have the Kotel, we have, we have uh, <clears throat> Rachel Imenu, we have Hebron, we have, we're gonna see Avraham Avinu, Yitzchak, we're gonna, we have all, all, all what belong to us, Hashem give us back. So remember my daughter, we are in Mashiach time. And then he took off his uh, uh, talit and filin, got out of the house, said, I'm going to the Makolet. The first time I see him after 20 years, he went to the Makolet. He brought half of the makolet to the house and uh, brought us food, flour, sugar, all what we need. And he says, did you eat? Did you eat? After three days, he asked us if we eat, if we had something to eat. So we didn't even answer him, like if we ate, if we didn't eat. All of a sudden, oh, you remember us that we're here. <laughs> so, so this is my father. That's the 67 war. Beautiful Very, stories, Esther. Beautiful stories. Yes, I'm happy. I hope that you're enjoying it. It's amazing. And then from there to uh, Baba Sali, 67, the Baba Sali make Aliyah from Morocco to Eretz Israel. And my father knew Baba Sali from Morocco, from that uh, dra, from the same city without a door that has not a door, Baba Sali also comes from there, from wow. that place, this Baba Sali. So like it says in the Torah, be careful with the poor people. You have to be very careful from poor people because the poor people, from them, the biggest Torah come out. So hizaharu bebnei aniim, be careful, because the biggest tzaddikim come from there. So we have to really never, never judge people by the money, what they have, what they don't have, because people have, the poor have, believe me, a lot more what we have. And we owe them a kavod, a big kavod, and irat shamayim, because to be poor, you consider as dead, as a dead. You chashuv like a dead but they're not dead, nothing dead. The, the poor are the smartest and Torah and knowledge that Hashem, Hashem always close to the poor. He is not close to the rich. Don't think when you're rich, be careful. Hashem likes the poor. He likes the people who suffer and to them he hear and he listen more. So I had all my life, like we were never rich, never. But I never felt poor, even though maybe we were poor. Maybe, maybe. If some people, like my other sister, who are older than me, two years old, she, she's married, she lives in Herzliya, she's very successful, she married a lawyer, she has a beautiful life. 
And she hears me when I tell my childhood story. She says, I don't know what are you telling? She doesn't believe. She said, how do you like this house? How do you love our childhood? I hate our childhood. And I said, how can you say that? If I had to choose again, I think that we were the richest. It's how I see, but again, I'm telling you my own sister who will tell you exactly opposite, but I think we were not poor. Why we were not poor? Because our parents, because who, my father, my father, who, when he came to Canada and I have to bring you into Canada because it's very important, the story. Are we okay with the time, Gail? How much time we have? Andy, no, I think, I think what we're gonna do is maybe we'll continue because another time, like, cause it's 9.43 and we still have to say the Tehillim. Yeah, but there the is story more, is amazing. So there's more, gonna, more beautiful story that I must, must tell you. Yeah. But okay, we'll keep it for we'll now. hold it. And the next <laughs> class I give, maybe I'll let you speak for five minutes because it's all about a moon and bitachon anyway. That's so right. Maybe, I think on Sunday, that would make sense to do a moon and bitachon, and this is the whole story of what you're saying. Esther, well, what, I, just, just one second. One thing I'll tell you. Before I start to talk, I said, I, oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to talk. I didn't prepare nothing. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> and then I lit the candle. I put it zdaka. I'm like Mrs. Hoffman. You know that I call Mrs. Hoffman. And I told her, she said, why do you want to talk to me? I said, because I want to be like you. Yeah. <laughs> told, right? You have to have a Svarty version. <laughs> you know, we have a Svarty. <laughs> the next story, I want to tell you about the real miracle that I saw next to my father, just when I was under umbrella of my father. The Wi-Fi of my father, you will freak out. So for the next time, okay, so I love you all. Write it down so you don't forget. So Make some notes. Right. Sunday, Mirza Shem, remind me on Sunday. And now we're going to say to Hillim for our... Like for the for in merit of the Shaduchim and Reb Meir Bal Hanais is on, and so is everyone's parents. It's my father in New York. So That's the name. Remember, my yeah, father, my in, New father York. in New York. Okay, go That's ahead. It. Yeah. Okay, we're saying this to Hillem uh, in the merit of all of the people who are looking for their Shidduch. So we'll say this together if everybody wants to unmute. Shirla Malot. Shirla Malot. Esa Enai, Esa Enai, El Heharim, El Heharim, Me Ayn Yavo Ezri, Me Ayn Yavo Ezri, Ezri Me Madonai, Ezri Me Madonai, Ose Shamaim Vaaret, Ose Shamaim Vaaret, Al Yitan, Al Yitan, La Motra Glecha, La Motra Glecha, Al Yanum Shomracha. Al Yanum Loya <laughs> He writes on me of an echad on Ilo Henu Velo Hevotenu, Shetamsi Zivu Graui Vehanun, the call echad me bne umi bnach Israel. Amen. 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 So, Esther, that was amazing. Like my heart was going up and down with every really? story. And my eyes were filling up with tears. I don't know, but like just the idea of who the Jewish people are in all the the trauma there was so well much esther you make it come alive you really it do does. You're amazing. Yeah. thank you thank you thank you, you. Thank you. Yes. sunday the father the story of my father in new york right okay in that's new great. york and mrs kramer that and uh, hurts kramer. her family <laughs> the marriage of mrs kramer this is amazing yeah they're amazing stories okay so everyone the gloves. <laughs>
Yeah, a wonderful good night. And I'm so happy you recorded it because this is like, it's really, it's history. Literally history. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.